is the Coffee with a Geek program. It is October of 2021. Of course, school year's flying by already. I have a really awesome guest. And of course, it's an honor and pleasure uh, to interview my longtime friend, uh, Jim Manley, the superintendent of KIPP New York City. Believe it or not, Jim and I grew up together in Fredonia, New York. And uh, after high school, we kind of just went our separate ways, went different paths. Uh, you know, school, family, all those things. So we've kept uh, somewhat of touch over the years, but uh, it's, it'll be a great to, to catch up with you. And, and interestingly enough, both of our paths brought us to education. So that's uh, interesting. And so let's just start quickly with, uh, thank you for being here, Jim, and tell me what is your favorite blend of coffee? I'm glad you gave me a heads up. So I had a minute to think. <laughs> blend of coffee and thank you Andrew it's nice to be here uh appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and it is great to reconnect um but I have stumbled on uh Jim's organic uh not my own uh but <laughs> organic, uh coffee and they make a really dark one called witch's brew that I really like um and I grind my own uh when I have time usually on the weekends and that's a, a special treat with a little bit of uh warmed up milk so yeah that's the way I, I like to do it best <laughs> Fantastic. It sounds good. And a good time of year for, for witch's brew, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so Jim, I want to ask you about kind of your path to education. Before we do that, because I, I know you and I grew up with you, um, you know, I was thinking as, as I was coming into this interview, kind of, you know, we could talk about your resume, which I'd like to, but there's also kind of your shadow resume, which is uh, your upbringing and your great family. And, you know, I think back to your older brothers who even to this day are larger in life to me, you know, they, they were so much older than us when we were little. Um, yep. But I have just such special memories of them. And again, if I, I see them today, I, I, I think of them as like giants to me. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then, you know, of course you've got your, your awesome sisters, uh, both, uh, both of them, uh, successful, uh, smart, successful, yep. stunningly beautiful, of course. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, great people to be around. And then, uh, then your parents, uh, your, your dad, who, uh, to me always growing up was kind of two sides of a, of a coin. There was the one side, the serious businessman suit tie briefcase. And yep. then there was the, uh, the funny side of him, the, the jokes, the, the, the storyteller, the, Mm -hmm. accents mm -hmm. <laughs> so he yes, was always indeed. uh yes indeed yeah you know, and always those those jokes are always fantastic and then of course there's your mom um best smile in the world you know um yep. You, yep. she would light up a room launch a thousand ships with that <laughs> smile and i i she sadly is it left us way too soon, but uh, I can picture her smile and her face like I, I just saw her an hour ago. Um, oh, nice. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, and the best chocolate chip cookies. Ever. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> You're, I miss good. those cookies. Uh, didn't matter whether they were fresh out of the oven or uh, a day old, they were the best cookies ever. And I, and I was thinking as I was we were approaching this interview and about those cookies, I was thinking, what was it? What was that magic formula to those uh, I know. cookies that you ingredient know. but uh i think it was love you know i think yeah. uh she put a lot of love in those cookies and for the bakers out there that's the magic isn't it um yeah and uh, sure. i don't know if you're a ted lasso fan but it's uh if you're not you should it's an inside joke but uh biscuits with the boss i don't know yes yes <laughs> no i i actually uh, over the past few uh, weeks and months, I've been hearing a lot of people say, like, you really need to watch that show. You remind me of Ted Lasso. You've got to. <laughs> so I finally geared up and I was a little nervous in, uh, about it because I was like, oh, no, who's this guy? Like, what all these people? <laughs> but I was pleased to see that he's like a character that uh, motivates through optimism. And I like to think that I, I try and do the same uh, with my team here. So I was I was uh, thrilled that that was the comparison. I hadn't thought about the baking. I've got to pick up my baking game for sure. Cause I, <laughs> yes. yes. Not at that well, level, again, I, I think it's the love that's the ingredient that's missing there. And that's, that ties back to your mom's uh, awesome cookies. Yes. Um, so, I mean, so think about that kind of that background. What did your parents teach you about education and, and how was that part of your journey into education? And then if you want to transition into uh, the more formal yeah. Uh, yeah. journey. 
Um, well, certainly, you know, my mom uh, was uh, was a guidance counselor before she'd met my father, uh, was working at Fredonia High, and um, she always loved education. And I, Andrew, you probably remember, we used to have to wait for my mom to take us home when we were uh, uh, having a, a play date together. And uh, my mom would run something called Magic Circle. And she would sit uh, in a room with a bunch of fourth graders and really try and do basically what is now social emotional learning and and talking about kids' feelings and things like that. And I just remember my mom just having so much patience um, with all the silliness that was going on and never got upset and never raised her voice. Similar when she taught us in Sunday school, because uh, we were silly then too. And she just always kind of just giggled her way through it and laughed at our terrible jokes and um, but still ended up, you know, giving us a lot of insight on the world. And so I think I took a lot from my mom in terms of just wanting to be around kids and, and trying to model a lot of patience. Uh, certainly my dad's sense of humor uh, helped me out a lot there. And then, you know, I think um, my brothers and sisters all in different ways dedicated their lives to service. Uh, my sisters did social work. Um, my brother David did the Peace Corps. Uh, and so, you know, all of those influences, I think, led me to Make the decision when I when I left college. I really had very little idea what I wanted to do, um, but I remember seeing in a. I went to Union College in Schenectady, New York, and I saw an advertisement uh, in our college uh, career paper that there was someone coming to talk about teaching in New York City, and that you didn't need a traditional teacher's license to teach in New York City. They were so short of teachers. This was way back in 1988 when I graduated. Uh, and I went to that um, info session. I was the only one who went. It was a Friday afternoon. And this guy had gone to a number of uh, more competitive colleges throughout the Northeast Ivy Leagues and the, you know, like the Colby's and Bates's of the world and things like that. And uh, he really just talked about what a profound experience he had had and uh, that you could literally walk up uh, to the you know, Department of Ed and you could really you interviewed in a day and you got your teacher certi certification. They had separated from New York State. They needed teachers so badly that they became their own certifying agency. Uh, and so I was literally, I was certified, you know, like, like a couple of hours. Um, and then I had to wait for my file number. And uh, I just started calling around districts and ended up teaching in a, in a really uh, difficult, poorly run, broken junior high school in central Harlem on 135th Street uh, and Edgecombe Avenue called IS 136. And uh, I taught there for, for three years and, um, you know, I to say this joke all the time, but I, you know, if anyone's listening who was one of my students, I apologize for all the malpractice that I uh, delivered at that point. I certainly learned a lot more about myself um, and what I was capable of than unfortunately I think the students learned from me. Um, but I learned about diversity. I learned about, um, you know, uh, equity and inclusion and, and all of those notions kind of before some of those terms were popular and, and grown up in a, you know, largely, uh, almost exclusively white uh, community and was teaching almost exclusively black and, and Latino, Latina students. And so, um, you know, I had a lot to learn. Um, and in that same time, I met someone who had, uh, was doing the Teach for America program and it had just started. Uh, and he encouraged me to get in touch with the people who were running that program. It was getting It was the same idea that I was doing just on a national scale of getting recent college graduates um, to come and teach in, in really underserved communities. And so um, I met uh, with the founder, Wendy Kopp, um, and she hired me on the spot because I had teaching experience. And then I worked uh, uh, for Teach for America for three years. I founded the site uh, in Washington, DC, uh, and was there for three years uh, and um, learned also what it meant to be kind of a, a little bit of an administrator. I wasn't supervising the teachers per se. They were all in different schools, but I was going and visiting them and trying to keep their morale up and give them some tips of the trade that I had learned over the course of my teaching experience. Um, and then went to graduate school uh, where I went and got a master's in public policy, uh, met my wife, uh, went to the Kennedy School of Government in Boston, um, and then got out and tried to start uh, my own my own school. Um, I won a fellowship to do that, was not successful in the end of the day. Um, through a lot of politics and red tape, but uh, found charter schools kind of at the end of that uh, um, scenario. Um, I should, well, I should mention going back for a second, I taught for three years while I was trying to start uh, my own school in New York City Public Schools. So I ended up teaching for six years in, in New York City Public Schools. Uh, and all that time was frustrated by a lot of the constraints that were there and my ability to make change and everything was kind of, um, you know, set in its ways and they weren't open to innovation and trying new things. and 
I heard about charter schools. They had started in New Jersey before they had started in New York. And I went over to uh, a community in New Jersey, a very mixed race community, um, and worked at a charter school that was run by parents. And I was there for about six years um, and then ended up back in New York City working uh, because that's really where I wanted to be at um, uh, Success Academy and then at KIPP, uh, where I'm now the superintendent. Yes, so many pieces, it sounds like, you know, from each experience you had, you you drew even, you know, more experience, more kind of a knack for, for education. So a for lot sure. of variation. And again, the, um, the diversity is so important. And, you know, I even think back to your original starting point of, of your mom and social emotional learning, you have a lot of those things kind of built in as you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as yep. you worked. Um, and, and yeah, and your mom always no, had that calming it. A presence. Of, a lot of those influences, you know, have taken me to this moment. I think, uh, um, you know, whether it's, as you said, just the, the ability to uh, understand where kids are coming from and, and uh, but also just learn a lot more about communities that were very different than my own and, and what it meant to go and teach in those communities. And, you know, just the importance of learning first rather than kind of, and which is not how I approached it at first. I came in and, you know, was trying to like teach kids and tell them I knew what was going on. And I found that really I needed to learn a lot more about who they were before I was going to be able to, to reach them and, and before they would trust me. Yeah. And that, um, you know, your, your story about your first class and how, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we all go through that growing pain as a teacher. Yeah. You, you walk in thinking you have all the answers and, and you're probably the least, you have a lot of passion, but you know, yes, you I did have that, that. I did. I worked really hard. I remember writing lesson plans till the early hours and I'm like, Oh, that's not going to work. You know, and then you would, you would spend just hours and hours on the lesson plans and it would blow up in the first six minutes. Cause somebody would be like, you know, getting out of their seat and walking around the classroom and you'd be like, what is happening? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, you know, and, and initially you, you go through that period where you blame the kids, you know, and I, I think the first few months I just thought, gosh, these kids are terrible. They don't listen to me, you know, and I, I can remember uh, a couple of kids in the front. There's always like those three kids who are listening to you and are bought in from the minute go, just as, you know, salt of the earth type kids. And I just remember two of these young ladies, they were both in about seventh grade and they just looked at me and they were just like, Mr. Manley, you need to show these kids you mean business. Like they're walking all over you. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, well, what does that mean? And she's just like, you know, you got to tell everybody what you expect. And, you know, they basically, like my, my teacher coaches, um, you know, and I remember going like, oh yeah, that does make sense. I guess I, you know, I just lose, I, you know, I'd just kind of be like, everybody sit down. But I wouldn't <laughs> know what the expectations were or what we were going to do. And uh, yeah, I made a, a lot of growth. Um, and, uh, but, you know, you really have to just, Kind of take a, a hard look at yourself, which is the hardest thing to do, I think, is, is once you realize that it's, it has nothing to do with the kids. It has everything to do with, with you. Um, that's why some people, you know, that's the kind of the big watershed moment in teaching, I think, is, is either you quit at that point or you're willing to really look inside yourself and figure out who you are and, and how to really communicate and connect with kids. And the people who do that, you know, have just giant success. Um, and so... That I think is the most important thing is just trying to be really honest with, uh, you know, who you are and how you're coming across. And do you find like now in your role as leadership, uh, you can relate that to new teachers coming in and try and give them that support and things that maybe you didn't have? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I mean, I think the world of teacher prep and education has gotten better. I think, you know, some of the, the things that we've done around just, um, Given, you know, I just had no tools whatsoever. And partially it's my own fault because I went into it without, you know, I hadn't taken an education class or anything. Um, uh, but even, even by the folks who I feel like do take education classes often lack the basics just in kind of how to set a really positive tone, but have limits and, and that sort of thing. A lot of education schools don't do that. Um, so we really do emphasize that for our, for our new teachers. Um, we have a fairly extensive year one training program. We call it teacher in residence program. And we really try and walk through um, both the, the, you know, kind of routines and how to set expectations in your room, but also the humanity of it and how to understand that, you know, um, 
kids all have reasons for the actions they choose. And part of your job is to figure out what those are uh, and to not just try and plow through them through, you know, force of will or raising your voice or whatever it might be or detention, but actually really trying to listen. Uh, and I think that's become, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic, I think the number of kids who've been through some level of trauma um, in, in during the pandemic has really raised the stakes on us, not, you know, just trying to do everything through force of personality or force of will, but really understanding kids are coming through a really hard time right now and we're gonna have to meet them where they are. Doesn't mean they can do anything they want. We have to always set limits and expectations, but at least know that uh, this is gonna take some time and we gotta give everybody a little bit of grace because it's been, you know, unlike any episode in modern history, uh, at least with modern education to try and imagine everybody coming back from, you know, living at home for a year and a half. Uh, and, and for many of our students, you know, at KIPP, probably 90% of our students live below the poverty line. Um, those are often, you know, situations at home that um, don't have some of the supports that we might want to have for, for young people, either, uh, you know, things going on in the home that, that weren't conducive to, to learning or just not enough supervision. I think that's probably mostly what we saw. A lot of parents just had to go back out and try and, and work and didn't have enough money for childcare. And so kids were at home uh, alone often. And, and that was, you know, raises its own set of challenges for uh, you know, if you've got three kids at home and the oldest is 12 and he's running run the household for the day, you can imagine that uh, I'm thinking of when you and I were kids and like we were left alone when we were 12. We, uh, you know, didn't always do positive things. Um, and so uh, we didn't burn you know, anything down, but we didn't. We tried, but uh, <laughs> we weren't successful. I think that was mostly my brother, though. But... Yes, I think that is true. I, would. I was not going to mention that, but. <laughs> Yes, I, well, but yes, I'll, I think, uh, you know, all of that, uh, and it, as you said, it all kind of traces back some of those, you know, I think as you get older, you realize that uh, there's there's nothing new under the sun. Some of these things that come on are the hottest, latest thing, you know, I'm like, well, my mom was actually doing that, you know, <laughs> right. uh, and we were talking about our feelings and emotions, you know, it's just like everything's a circle. And so just trying to keep that in that uh the good times are not as probably as good as they seem and the bad times aren't as bad and, and just trying to keep a steady, even keel through all of that. I think too, you know, you mentioned the challenges for students. Uh, I think there's been some challenges for teachers too. I think we just assume, hey, they, they jump right back into it and all would be good. And I, I think there's definitely some, some stress and some, you know, emotions mm -hmm. that need to be dealt with there too. Um, for sure. And that's so, where I'm really trying yeah. to to listen to our staff and our, our principals because, you know, I, I, because I was raised by my dad and you just always did hard work and that was what, just what you did. You know, I think uh, um, I have a little bit of a bias that we just need to jump back in and get right after it. And, and um, that's just not where a lot of people are. They also had their own, uh, you know, where people got sick in their household or, or where they were stressed about money and all kinds of things for adults that, taking them a time to, to recover. Um, and so trying to meet them where they are as well. Um, you know, it's hard because you've got the needs of kids and the needs of teachers. And, and sometimes they almost feel like they're a little bit in, in uh, opposition. And, and the true answer I know is both, right? Like both need to be true. We need to take care of everybody. Um, and so uh, that's a balance. And, and, you know, so far I feel like, you know, parents get it a little bit. We're, we're giving back some extra days like at uh, the holidays this year uh, to give our teachers a longer Christmas break just because everybody feels so exhausted. Um, our, you know, as we talked about it with our parent groups, um, they were largely supportive. They, you know, they, they understood. They were like, yeah, it's, it must be hard. I can imagine that like coming back into schools right now is difficult. So I do think people are willing to give each other grace. Uh, we just need to make sure we talk about it a lot. So I'm going to kind of pull these next two questions together. So in 2010, you were part of a documentary called The Lottery, which you can yep. still find, I think, on uh, Prime Video um, and, and on the Internet in general. And to think back when I watched it a few years ago, uh, you know, it, it kind of chronicled the, the time where you were trying to get to uh, Success Academy charter schools yep. going. Yep. Uh, you had challenges, obstacles, teachers, unions, uh, you know, parent groups, you had that. And then you but your goal was to provide an alternative school for for families. And yep. largely you yep. did that. 
but the the heartbreaking piece of that was just it was part of a lottery system where some people just by the luck of a draw couldn't go and it was heartbreaking to see families that wanted a different uh school setting yes weren't able to yeah. do that looking back on that what were some kind of lessons you learned from that because certainly that was a trial by fire if it's accurate to the document if the mm-hmm, documentary mm-hmm. is accurate to what was going sure, on sure. but what lessons so what lessons do you learn looking back on it there and then are, have we moved the needle at all to making some changes now yeah in education are we still there big yeah. question i know yeah big question i think um Certainly with, uh, you know, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is what I always ex- suspected about the kids that I have worked with uh, who are growing up in poverty in, in New York City is that they're incredibly capable and they really needed a school that matched their potential. Um, and the first schools that I worked at through often a lot of rules and regulations and red tape were not able to provide the kind of education that I thought students deserved. And, and you know, my time at Success really demonstrated that if you if you really got the, the right group of people who were committed to excellence, um, working with kids, that they would excel uh, and exceed expectations. And they really did. You know, I, my, in the first year that my school uh, took the New York State test, we were the highest scoring uh, school in the history of District 5 in New York City on the very first time we ever did it. Um, we outscored most of our local uh, co-located schools by 40, 50 percentage points. Um, and you know, at the end of the, the time that I left success, our students were passing the state test uh, on par with the wealthiest districts in Westchester, which are some of the wealthiest in the country. Um, and so you know, we felt really, that, that's like a radical notion in this country because we've often felt like, okay, well, you know, Schools that are immersed in poverty, um, those students are kind of because of all the other societal ills that, that are kind of afflicting them, they can't achieve at that level. And, and really, we proved that that's not the case, um, that if you invested enough in schools, kids could get really dramatically better results. Um, I think, unfortunately, and my boss had a lot to do with this, if you watch the documentary, she was very uh, anti-union, and uh, it became, you know, a really bitter acrimonious uh, fight um, that I think, unfortunately, uh, erased what was really prof- the lesson that I just mentioned, which I think was really profound, which is that our kids deserve better. Uh, and unfortunately, it got caught up in adults versus, you know, union versus non-union and worker rights and rules and pensions and all kinds of things that, are, you know, that matters. But like, it, it still obscured the headline, which is that if we really were serious about education reform in this country, um, we could dramatically uh, change the outcomes for the vast majority of kids in our schools. Um, and I don't know how much we've moved the needle. I feel like we missed some of that that um, notion. Um, and I'm hopeful that you know coming out of the pandemic, we can try again. I do think charters in general have fallen short of what I hoped they would be able to do. I thought they'd be able to prove the possible and, and it would move other schools to take up some of that. Uh, I'm not sure that that's happened. And there, you know, there's lots of reasons. Um, but you know, I think some of the key ingredients that we've done around teacher training, longer school days, longer school year, um, a higher kind of uh, attention to uh, teacher intellectual preparation and using data, those kinds of things that I think have been really transformational, um, have not permeated all schools. Um, throughout the country. And I think those are, those are missed opportunities that uh, I think are, are holding us back. But again, I think part, part of that blame is on charter schools. I think they, they were not as collaborative as they could have been with district schools and it created an us versus them, which uh, doesn't work for anybody. Uh, and so unfortunately, I think a lot of, a lot of the debate has, has yeah, as it often does, uh, moves beyond kids and gets into adults. And when that happens, uh, I think kids lose. Uh, and so that's, that's, I think the, the challenge that we face is can we really, can we really recommit to, to being there for kids? Um, I, I often quote Dr. Keller who said you can kind of tell the health of any society by the way they treat their children. Um, and I think that's a question we have to keep asking ourselves as a country. Do you think the KIPP model that you've 
been a part of? Is that something that can be replicated? Um, I, I do think uh, the reason I moved from success to KIPP is that I felt like KIPP also brought in, uh, you know, success was very strict in terms of behavioral expectations and, and uh, often I thought was, was uh, a little too oppressive for kids. Uh, and I thought KIPP did a better job of holding out academic excellence, but also recognizing that, that kids are kids and they should be allowed to have some self-expression and, and, uh, and we should affirm their identities and, and, uh, meet them where they are. And so, yes, I do think, I do think we have good things to share with the larger world out there. Um, and we're trying, uh, I think we've been more collaborative in our stance than, uh, than other places, uh, and that hopefully will serve us well. Um, kind of a side question. You and I both went to Fredonia high school, public school here in Western New York. And I think, I think we would both agree it was a pretty quality education. Um, lessons you learned from Fredonia? I think, uh, you know, um, the power of, of, uh, of community, um, from Fredonia, I think is, is one that I still hold dear. I think the fact that, uh, you knew everybody when you went to the grocery store and wherever you went. And, uh, I really tried to take that approach to the schools that I work in and the, 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 the team I work with now, even though it's quite large, I really make an emphasis to try and get to know as many people as I can and to know their first names and, uh, address them when I pass them by. I think um, that sense of, of community allows a group of people to work together uh, a lot more effectively. So I've, I've tried to bring that forward for sure. That's a great way to put it. And I th also think it allows us to communicate even when we disagree uh, with each yep. other. Definitely, definitely. So uh, thoughts on educational technology? Well, we certainly have been, you know, we, we learned a lot in the past uh, year and a half. Uh, <laughs> sure. And uh by, by fire. I think, you know, we, we, um, we were fortunate at KIPP that we had already made a big investment in, in uh, laptops right uh, a couple of years prior. So we were able to kind of deliver, um, uh, you know, computer and technology to our kids uh, because we were closed for so long. Um, and I, you know, I think we have seen that certain areas were really supported um, by solid educational technology. Uh, and then other areas really were challenging. I think teaching kids to read um, and phonics and things like that was very difficult through technology and through Zoom calls uh, and for little guys. That said, I think um, extra help and remediation and practice in math, uh, we used a program called ZERN, Z-E-A-R-N, uh, which is a math program that actually just produced terrific results for our kids who were who were really uh, you know serious about uh, staying with it. Um, and so you know I think I think it's uh, I think probably my biggest lesson is high quality instruction really matters. In person is better, but technology has a lot of room to help us with kind of extra practice, extra um, bites of the apple, and and also an opportunity for kids who didn't get it the first time to uh, get another chance to learn it without slowing down their regular curriculum uh, and, and catch back up. Uh, and so we're trying to keep that piece and really use technology to help, you know, th that whole debate versus should we be remediating or accelerating? And I think we're trying to say we should be accelerating while also using technology to remediate the gaps that, that kids have along the way. And so, you know, I do think that there's there is a good mix. Uh, it should, like anything, it's never all or nothing. And so, um, you know, trying to do both well, I think is, is probably the, the right answer. So um, as we were talking kind of offline here, we were saying, uh, you know, you and I are at the kind of the ending portion of our, of our careers. Not, not done yet, I, I wouldn't think, but uh, what, where do you see yourself in say five years or so? Um, what yeah. are some next steps or what are your visions? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I'm obviously thinking a little bit about it, uh, 55 now, and uh, I, I've been the superintendent of KIPP NYC for, for seven years. And, uh, you know, I think uh, at a certain point, uh, new blood is always good in a role like that. Um, and so, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested in finding my successor and helping that person really gear up and be ready in the next, you know, three or four years, something like that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, you know, I, I, I still love being in schools. Um, and I don't know if that means like consulting and helping new leaders as they're coming along or getting back in, uh, teaching, uh, again, um, but I, I would love to stay connected to kids. I feel like they keep me young uh, and it gives me great joy. Um, but uh, also know that, um, you know, new leadership is often good leadership. And uh, and so I want to make sure that I don't, I'm not standing in the way uh, and letting new folks come and bring their energy to the game. So I want to ask maybe a sidebar question. I do want to be responsive with your time. I know you've got uh, a busy schedule, but um do you remember as kids the uh, dead man's curve uh, incident, the sledding incident? The sledding incident where <laughs> yeah. I, I think was that, did I get sledded into or <laughs> no. I, can't remember. I, I remember having some shoulder injury. But... Yeah. <laughs> shoulder injury, head <laughs> injury. I think uh, well, I was thinking about it because October is anti-bullying, I think, awareness month. And uh, I was thinking about this story because uh, I'll try and make this brief, but I think it was a snow day and a snow day in the seventies was magic, right? Your parents said, just get out of the house, right? (laughs) So we did, we took our little sleds, you know, the Rosebud model sled with the runners and everything and went uh, behind the Wheelock school. And there was that big hill that was, it was actually, there was trees on the hill itself, but, you know, being the ingenious Uh, rascals all of the kids were we created kind of our own little sledding paradise of different trails and (laughs) and absolutely true in one of those hills somebody had made kind of like a luge run that that curved around and we of course called it dead man's curve and yes indeed and if you didn't know how to steer the sled you ran into a very large tree trunk i think it was probably one of fredonia's early pioneer trees <laughs> yes it was, indeed it was like yes, nine indeed. feet tall so of course my brother went and i went of course he made me go and through threat of violence and then uh, then you were there and he's like i don't think i want to do that i'm not good enough <laughs> we're just like jim you're doing it we totally bullied you <laughs> we, t- we we bullied you probably for 10 minutes <laughs> so he said okay i'm gonna do it and you ran right into that tree, right into the tree right into yeah. the tree and both my brother and i looked at each other and said he's dead <laughs> like, <laughs> and you you scared me so bad i i've I, I would like to hope that i've never bullied anybody since then because we were so scared that we uh we you pressured me. you into <laughs> well that explains a lot of the mistakes i've made in my life i think i can trace it back to that moment uh and probably losing a few thousand brain cells along the way <laughs> I hold no grudge for it. I'm sure that. Well, uh, thank you. My, you were flat I think out my dad on the to, I think my dad put you to work every time you came to visit us. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, yes, he the did. The money uh, for all of the indentured servitude <laughs> that uh, that happened there. <laughs> Those were good days, and, and we survived. We, we survived. did. We, we did. survived the we 70s. Did. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I'll ask you just. Can I ask you three brief speed geek questions? Okay. Sure. All right. What's your first storage device? First storage device, like floppy disk. Um, yeah, I get, or yeah, maybe my iP- my um, iPod. Uh, all right, I, iPod was the documents the... on there and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I can go back even further with you and me because didn't we do the the course with um, the Commodore, the Commodore? Yeah, yeah. The Commodore I had the Commodore sixty four at home and the yeah. Jumpman and the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, what's your favorite educational blog? Um, I read the Education Gadfly. I think that was an interesting one. It's out of Fordham. Oh uh, yeah, Fordham University. Yep. Yep. That's a solid one. Yep. Uh, what's your whimsy? Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter. Hmm. I guess uh, Star Wars. Although I got my kids down to watch it, you know, like ten years ago, and I don't think they made it through the first ten minutes. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh it no! Didn't, it didn't hold up the way I I remember. Oh no, that's that's. You know, that's I remember the two of us having uh, lightsaber wars in the backyard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite app? Huh, my favorite app. I, sadly, it's probably like the Metro North train app because I'm always looking <laughs> trying to get around. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. And the last one, uh, what's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Uh, it's a good question. I was about to say read, but now I use like a Kindle, so it doesn't fully count. <laughs> right. uh, uh, probably um, uh, just walking my dog. That is a good one. That is a good one. All right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for connecting again. We'll keep in touch. Pleasure, Hopefully a lot better. And, uh, thank you. Talk to you thank soon. Thank you. All right. Take care.